in the second part, we're going to look at, so we have now written a, a syntax for our nice little language. Um, uh, now we want to have a type checker for it. And, uh, and, and for that purpose, we have, uh, we are developing statics. Um, so what is statics? Um, well, it's joint work with uh, many people. Uh, so Henrik van Antwerpen is actually the, the implementer of, uh, of statics, uh, but we have also had, uh, Arjen Ravoot has implemented uh, another version of statics. Uh, and Andrew and uh, Kasper and Pierre have uh, um, helped developing the scope graph framework, which is a theoretical basis for um, uh, for statics, for a part of statics. Uh, and there are other people involved. And many students have been trying it out uh, and so on. Um, so let's see. Um, so what's the goal of statics? We want to have uh, a static semantics definition. So define the static semantics of a programming language. Again, it should be high level and understandable, possibly usable as reference documentation, executable, so we want to execute language definitions, static semantics definitions as, uh, as type checkers. Declarative, so you should be able to understand the, uh, the declarative semantics. Um, uh, Multipurpose, so type checkers, but there are other kinds of tools, for instance, code completion uh, that we would like to get. And it should be correct by construction, right? It should be, the implementation we get should be sound with respect to the declarative semantics, right? Just as in the case of, of parsing, right, of the syntax definition, the, the, the behavior we get in the editor, the parser is sound with respect to the semantics, which is, well, from a semantics, we describe, we, we see what the, what the structure of fees are. And without having to think about the parsing algorithm, we, sh we, sh we are able to understand whether a parse is correct or, or not. So how does that work uh, in, uh, so statics is a constraint based uh, language. Uh, with the declarative semantics. So we, we say what a solution, whether a solution satisfies a, a specification. Uh, and, and that is what, what we're interested in understanding. And then it's the job of the solver to figure out how to find solutions. Um, and uh, what is special about statics is that it does name binding as part of constraint solving, rather than as a, as a step that you do before constraint solving, it is integrated in, uh, in constraint solving. And so we write a specification. We have a solver that interprets the specifications as type checkers. We have uh, reasons that this is uh, sound with respect to the semantics. And uh, the scheduling of constraint resolution is based on language independent principles. And it means that you don't have to think about uh, scheduling so much as you do when writing type checkers by hand. Um, so these are the main publications uh, about statics. So the, the, the work started with, uh, well, before we had statics, we had enable or NABL for name binding language. Uh, and that was a, a meta DSL like, uh, that was th that was specifically targeted at describing the name binding rules of, of programming languages. And uh, that was uh, ad hoc. At, at some point we had a project that said, well, let's formalize the semantics of programming languages, including name binding. And then we needed sort of a meta semantics of that name binding language. and trying to figure that out turned out to be quite uh, tricky. And that led to a, uh, a theoretical framework uh, for scope graphs and, and a theory of name resolution that is described in this ESO paper. Uh, based on that notion of scope graph, we develop um, uh, a constraint language for static semantic analysis based on scope graph, which we described in the PEPM paper. And then um, in that paper, we had a strict separation between constraint generation and constraint solving. So you would map an AST to a bunch of constraints and then solve them. It, that turned out not to be powerful enough to describe things like uh, like structural types. And so in this paper in Oops 2018, we developed statics where constraint solving and, and, and constraint expansion are, are combined. Uh, um, and in that paper, we show how to deal with a bunch of, uh, of type systems such as structural types and, and generics. So in this tutorial, what I'm going to do is show statics by example, basically defining a static semantics for the, the language we just defined the syntax of. And um, 
we'll not well we'll see how far we get um, i'm not uh, in the in the example language i haven't included uh, these uh, fancy type systems like with structural types and, and generics and so on um, okay so as i said i have beautiful slides and 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 uh, we could come back to those slides and this, the slides have pictures of scope graphs and, and they are animated and, and but well you know my PhD students wanted me to live program, so let's uh, let's try that. But anytime uh, you get confused about the the concepts, we could go back to the slides and look at uh, pictures of scope graphs because we're not generating those uh, by the tool. So you have to sort of have this conceptual understanding. Um, but let's see let's see how far we get. Um, yes, um, yes. I'm looking for my eclipse. Um, here it is. Um, yes, let me share this. Um, statics. Okay, so we're back uh, in eclipse. Um, and now I have, uh, we have completed the syntax definition and actually what I've done is I've uh, modularized it. So uh, syntax for Booleans, uh, for uh, numbers, uh, for what else did we look at? Um, well, we have syntax for functions, function literals, lambda, so application and various function literals. Um, we have uh, records, um, so we have rec record types and record uh, literals, and we have uh, modules. Um, so we didn't actually get to those uh, for the syntax definition, but uh, they make for interesting um, um, static semantics. Um, all right, so. So let's start with, uh, so we're not going to, oh, what's, yeah, so what one detail that we should look at in, um, so what I've been showing is from a, uh, um, an expression, we get, uh, let me build this. That we actually have a parse. Oh, it gives me a syntax. Uh, this is a type check error, um, right? So when, when I parse this, um, oh, come on. I should get an AST. Something is broken. Come on. All right, uh, this is annoying.
I'm just going to restart. I'm not sure what the... Uh... All right, that is uh, super annoying. Uh, so is it stuck? Maybe four yes. quid? Yes, I was trying to do that. Oh. Um, maybe four squids. Um, But I have another eclipse that's, um, yeah, the problem is <laughs> if I look in my, uh, I have a couple of eclipses running and if I just kill one. So here's another, uh, another thing I can do. Um, so I had prepared a project. Um, yeah, just like the case for, uh, uh, check, yeah. Just like the case for uh, for syntax, I would live program the, the rules for the static semantics and I had commented out uh, most of the static semantic rules, but I think I that broke uh, something and uh, so, what I'm going to do is uh, here's here's the version of the project with uh, that is that has a complete implementation, and I'll just uh, we'll just look at uh, at the rules together. Um, uh, that way, uh, well, we know that uh, that thing to actually work. Um, so let me continue. Um, what I said is when we looked at uh, at parsing, what we get is an AST, right? And that AST is based on the uh, on the grammar rules. And, uh, but actually there is a, uh, so not only do we get such an AST, we also generate uh, schemas for such ASTs. So if we look at the source gen folder of this, uh, this project, we see that we get a, uh, a bunch of signatures um, that correspond to the syntax uh, for example, if you take the syntax of numbers, um, right, this was our syntax definition. Uh, we defined a bunch of productions. Each production ha has a, uh, uh, a constructor and, and, and a right-hand side and return those, um, why did I? Uh, return those constructors or those productions into uh, 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 signature constructor declarations in, al in an algebraic signature. All right, so given this production, we get the signature that says an addition add is a production for that takes two expressions and returns an, an expression. And we generate such a schema automatically from the grammar, including all the sorts, uh, etc. And uh, so given an SDF definition, we get a, a parser, but also an algebraic data type for the ASTs of our, of our language. And we'll be working against the, such an algebraic signatures in in uh, in our definition. Um, 
So where should I start? In uh, right. So what we do in so statics is a uh, a logic programming language in the sense that we define uh, predicates. We we define uh, predicates that determine whether a an AST the AST of a program is is well typed uh, somehow. And uh, so I've organized this language as a, a base language that is extended with various language components or features. And, and for each of those features, I'm defining a bunch of predicates. So for example, um, I have defined a uh, predicate type of exp that uh, says the uh, given a scope and an expression uh, and a type uh, that explains, well, within the scope, this expression has this type. Uh, and that is a sort of a logical statement. A, it's a statement about an expression. Similarly, we can have a, a statement about syntactic types in terms of semantic types. And the distinction there is that in syntactic types, we can have names and we can we want to turn those names into, uh, into types. And for things like declarations, uh, we want to say, well, a declaration is okay. So this declaration is okay in this, in this scope. And, and that may involve adding declaration to such a, a scope or that or it should it, it involve may involve that scope having a certain declaration as we will see um, okay so let's let's start uh, simple and start with uh, looking at uh, numbers again anytime please interrupt me if you have a question or if something is not uh, if something is not clear um, Right, so if I want to uh, type check uh, an expression uh, like uh, numbers or booleans, let's let's do them together. Um, uh, then basically, I define uh, I didn't I define this this predicate uh, that says uh, well, what the type of an integer content is uh, is int, and if E expression E has type int, then min E has type int. And if E1 has type int and E2 has type int, then the addition of E1 and E2 has type int, etc. Right? And this is, uh, you should have, you have seen this before, probably, right? If I have a disjunction and the two disjuncts are Booleans, then the result is also a Boolean. And, uh, Can the completed example be committed back? I don't understand the question. So the completed example is the London uh, project in the, uh, the London language project. Int and bool here are defined for our language by hands. Uh, yes, okay, so what, what are these things? So let's uh, let's see. Um, if I look at, um, the syntax definition, okay, let, let me put the, the syntax definition here side by side. So in addition to the, uh, in, in the base language, I defined, um, sorts like uh, expression and type, um, uh, and then in each of these language modules, I extend that uh, that that sort with new productions, but I also, uh, for, for example, uh, extend the sort of uh, types with an int literal and and semantic types here is uh, is also defined here. So int with all capitals, as I'm using it here, is just a term like like other terms. So it's not defined off screen; it's defined in a different module. Right. So that's the. Uh, still defined formally. Um, for, in particular, right, if I uh, do things like uh, two plus true, uh, that is a, a syntactically correct uh, term. Right? If I parse it, I, I get the, uh, the term, um, an expression of add with an integer content and a true, uh, but that is, that is ill-typed because I'm expecting an int uh, as an argument of, uh, of addition and not, not a bool. All right, this is all, I see you're falling asleep. So this must be, uh, must be pretty straightforward. 
Okay, so let's then, uh, so all the interesting things in type checking come from names, right? So uh, we say we, uh, we use a name um, and then, uh, or we define a name and then we, uh, we want to use it. And um, right. So now it's complaining that A and B are, are uh, already defined. Um, so let's uh, sandbox it. Right, so here I'm defining a name and here I'm, I'm using that name and uh, uh, and that name and, and, and that thing as a type uh, that I'm uh, checking and that should be consistent. Um, Uh, etc. So uh, a lot of complication in type checking comes from dealing with uh, with names, and and in, in statics we do do that with uh, with scope graphs. And uh, so let's see how that uh, how that works. Um, in um, right. So so what is the what is the syntax we have here? Um, Um, so we have a uh, so so a thing like this is called is a definition, and it has a uh, it has a binding, which binds uh, some expression to uh, to a name to a variable, uh, and that can be any any expression. And but we can also type uh, type these things. So we can say um, a should have uh, type int and b should have type bool. And then we would like to to check that, um, etc. Um, so to uh, define the, the 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 rules for these uh, uh, these predicates, what we do is uh, uh, let's see. So let's let's start with uh, this. This whole thing is a declaration. So we have a decal, uh, a declaration which is a, a definition, and that definition has a binding. And uh, so we're checking to, to check if a declaration is okay, we must check that uh, a binding is okay. And bindings come in two, uh, two cases. Um, so let me, let's look at the syntax here, or at the abstract syntax. Um, so we have a bind uh, and a bind T and a bind T uh, explicitly has a, uh, introduces a type. Um, so, so here we have a bit of inference, right? So we, uh, we check the type, uh, we, we compute the type of an expression E, which is some, uh, some constraint variable, uh, big T. And then we want to declare that, uh, that the, the name X has type, uh, has type T. Yeah. So is this uh, format uh, with Eclipse working or should I uh, switch to slides? Works for me so, so far, uh, though I wanted to ask, uh, is it basically implementing th this set of rules you're showing is basically implementing bidirectional type checking? Uh, Am I right? In what sense? Uh, in a sense that, yeah, you have typed bindings and untyped bindings, and you switch between checking and inference with no, here, no. here with kind of manual invocation of this inference procedure, or no, no, there is no, there is no bidirectional type checking. So what you do in uh, such a constraint definition is you uh, take a uh, a constraint and basically these rules are simplification rules, right? You say, if I uh, uh, ask whether this binding is okay, I can simplify to, to the question is, does this expression have this type? And does this uh, name 
have this um, is a declared as a variable in this scope using this type. And these so so the 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 the, uh, um, the statement the bind okay is simplified into simpler statements, type of ex expression and and declare var. Does that make sense? And so basically, we have a you can simplify such a predicate, right? I mean the the the, the the core predicate is, uh, is, I'm sorry, is this, right? Is, is program okay? And that uh, simplifies to, well, are all the declarations okay? And, and that means, is each declaration okay? And so basically it simplify, and, and those uh, simplify to either unification constraints or binding constraints, scope graph con constraints. And then the solver, well, the, the job of the solver is to simplify such user-defined constraints and solving uh, binding constraints and unification constraints. And there's no, uh, there's no order in saying, well, this argument should be defined uh, in, in a certain way. If that uh, makes sense, Alexander. Well, I'm not sure I really understood that. Okay, that distinction, but probably I'm not understanding very well the bidirectional type cheating. Right. Uh, okay. But like the, the this form, like prolog style description of the predicates and logic is very familiar for me at least. Mm -hmm. So. That I am following completely. Okay, yeah. good. Okay, so the distinction, is, right? I mean, this is uh, these are sort of prolog rules, you could say, right? I mean, the, the premises imply uh, the conclusion, uh, but uh, there's no backtracking. So the choice of rule is is determined purely by the by the head clause. Uh, so uh, they're basically syntax directed rules. Uh, so you should have one rule per Per syntax case, so there's backtracking to, in a sense, to find the case. But once you have matched the hat of a of a of a, of a rule, then you commit to this rule. And, you do, and if one of the premises fails, you don't backtrack to try another rules. So there's no overlap between rules. And so it's pure. So, yeah, go okay. ahead. Go ahead, Fabio. Ah, thank you. So, so, so if I had some language like uh, like C, where there's like number literals that could basically take on, you know, could be either ints or floats. Mm -hmm. um, how, how would, would I? You, how would you do that? Um, yeah. Good question. So, uh, let's go to the numbers, right? So, um, and what you are saying is we have a. Um, sort, uh, no, we have a uh, constructor uh, float as a type, right? Um, what am I doing wrong? Yes. Yes, yeah. Um, and now uh, I have some rules that say, if I add an int and an int, it becomes an int, uh, but if I add an int and a float, it becomes a float, right? I mean, that's the, the kind of rule you have in mind, I guess. I mean, most interesting would be the, the literal case. What is the literal case? Like the, the, the I have an integer number, like there's no, there's no uh, uh, decimal point in there or something like as, uh -huh. a, as a, a token. So that typically generates an int a AST node. Yes. But it could also type check as a float. Right, but then you want to have some kind of coercion, right? Um, sure, I guess that, that that would be a different way to do it. I mean, yeah. So, so, so actually, in pretty much all these languages, at least C family, as far as I remember, you have to disambiguate on this uh, literal level. So, if you want float literal or double literal, you have to put dot there. Otherwise, it's int and no questions and no inference around that. You might coerce it or, or convert to a float later, like with uh, 
explicit or implicit coercion in C or Java or, or something. But on the level of literals, usually uh, they require this explicit disintegration with both uh, decimal point and uh, F for floats, uh, like postfix even. Like you have manually disambiguated between float literals and double literals. Yeah, that's fair. I guess uh, the, the question, so type checking kind of like happens slightly earlier. So if you wanted to integrate that in your type checker, um, you would have to do it differently, right? I'm not sure I'm uh, full. I'm just typing here. So, uh, so, so this is a way you can do that, deal with that kind of uh, overloading, right? I mean, uh, where you say that's uh, uh, and so in fact, uh, uh, so I have a couple of students doing C in uh, in statics and and uh, and this is the kind of uh, thing you have to do, right? You do operations on on types rather than saying directly, I check what the type is here. I just say, well, what what is the type? What what are the types of the arguments? And then I have, I need to compute when I combine types uh, with, well, I could say I have a special rule for additions or I have a, a general rule for uh, for bin ops, right? I mean, that could be another, uh, if you have a whole class of operations which have the same behavior, you could, you could uh, combine that. But if you have, I don't know, special rules for multiplication, then you would, you would, you would, uh, you could specialize it like that. Um, does that make sense, Fabio? Yeah, I guess the other way would be to do some subtyping thing for, for the coercible things, now that I think of it more. Uh, well, you still, yes, okay. I, I think the, the other thing I did here is define a, um, a kind of least upper bound operation. Right, uh, where you, um, but essentially that is what what I've been defining here, right? I mean, you could call this this uh, the least upper bound of uh, of, and then um, that is basically what I oops what I'm uh, what I'm doing here. Um, so that's, does that make sense? Um, yeah, so and, and, and so this is actually one of the features that distinguishes statics from enable to its a predecessor, which also does this, this is constraint approach is here you can define have user definable predicates on types in, in enable to we had a mapping from ASTs to constraints and then that was it here we can define so called user definable constraints, we can define computations on types to, uh, well, to do computations like uh, like these. But uh, do you in general assume that, that the types are principal, like there that there's only just just one type for a particular expression, or when um, you get to look up things like overloaded methods and so on, um, could it be uh, that that there are multiple types? Mm -hmm. uh, well, that there are multiple things that you resolve to, um, so that may be different from from principal types. I mean, no, I mean we. Uh, Well, we we con could compute a set of things here, uh, uh, or a list of types, or um, in general, Henrik. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking. How would you answer that question? I would say it's most natural if that's the case. Yes, if uh, if things have that. so. Um, in terms of the semantics of of statics, it's um, it's. Well, you could think of it as being somewhat in between a, a functional programming language and a, a logic language like Prolog. So um, there is unification going on when these things are simplified. Uh, so in that sense, there is no uh, direction that's enforced by the way that you write the specification. However, we do have the restriction that the rules are syntax directed. So if we cannot sort of determine um, what a value of a logical variable is. We cannot simplify a rule yet, and we won't do a full search in the way that, for example, Prolog would do it. 
in that sense, there is inference based on that it's always sort of a deterministic kind of inference. So if we really know, okay, this must be the rule case that's applied, then we do the simplification. If we uh, find the value for a logical variable, well, we do, then we do unification. That's it's a committed choice, basically. So in that sense, there's no search where you say, well, I have a whole bunch of rules that assign different types to this construct and I'll just see which one works out in the end. Uh, that's not how it works. You could probably encode a search procedure like that sort of explicitly, but then of course it would not be very idiomatic code and would be pretty hard to understand. So statics might not be the, or let's say that would not be the right approach if you are using statics, I would say. Cool, thanks. Okay. Um... Right, but you mentioned overloading, right? So that is a way where you say, well. Uh, oh yeah, so, so there, like there, in, yeah. Uh, so in C sharp, I could, for example, you know, um, implement a class that uh, implements both uh, uh, iterable of string and iterable of integer. And so then when I have an instance of that class and I call a method that it inherits from iterable, it's not quite clear whether it's the one that it inherited from uh, int or uh, from, from iterable of int or iterable of string, which would then mean that the return type is kind of, you know, dependent on. Sure. Uh, but that is not, yeah, okay. So, but, but that has to do with name resolution, I think. Uh, as I understand, but I mean, but is that really overloading, or is that a matter of there are yeah, different yeah. So, instances? Well, I mean, in that in that case, the class will have an overloaded um, version of each of the method that inherit that it inherits from iterable. All oh, right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. So basically, it has uh, methods with the same name but with different types, um, and then you need to. But then you. So then basically, you need to include the type signature in the. Um, in the name of the of the method you're uh, involving, or you need to involve the the type of the arguments in resolution of the name, right? So the the name is ambiguous, and then you need to resolve that ambiguity. Uh, um, yeah, but it might just be based on the types of your environment or what you're expecting, or right. or you might get a, an ambiguity error, one of those. Right. Okay. So so I'm not going to talk about. Uh, um, the, uh, disambiguation by types in, in this in this tutorial, uh, but we are going to look at uh, we're going to, to, to look a lot at disambiguation of names because that is sort of essential in um, uh, in name binding, right? Um, right. So so let's go back to this example here. Right. We we saw that uh, we defined a name here and we can refer to a name. And uh, that is achieved by, uh, well, we said here, this declaration lives in, in some scope, and we're going to do the binding uh, re relative to that scope. And I've defined the, uh, the resolution policy, uh, let me show, uh, down here. So what I've done is I've declared a, a relation var that uh, relates an identifier to a type, and that relation is defined to be functional. So there's one type associated one with one type, uh, one type associated with one uh, identifier. Then you find a couple of predicates to encapsulate the the binding for uh, identifiers. So I've declare var that says, well, declare that this variable is defined, resolve var, which is uh, well query for resolution. Uh, let's forget about vars in scope for now. And type of var is the is the uh, is the resolution that I use at the high level where I say, give me the type of this uh, of this identifier. Um, okay, so what does declare var do? It says, um, um, yeah, I should I should make a simpler version of this first to uh, uh, explain things. Um, so. Um, like this, and like this. Mm. Okay. 
and then remove this here. Okay, so what's the idea? Declare var is just a predicate that says uh, declare in scope s that variable identifier x has type t. Um, and we have uh, we we set an attribute on the tree that uh, that says the type of this identifier is t, and that helps in uh, in hovering. So if we hover over this uh, declaration, can you see the the pop up? And it shows that it's a type of int. Yep. Yep. Okay. And then type of var. Uh, that's what we used in uh, right when we when we type an expression. Then we have a uh, we have a var, right? Something like uh, like an occurrence of a, of a variable. Then, uh, well, you would say, well, what is the type of that variable? We look look up the type of the variable, and we implement that by uh, uh, by calling resolve var, yet another predicate. It should return some tuple with x prime, which is the definition or the declaration of the name, and the type that we declared it with. And then we have some additional. So we also uh, declare the type. So if we hover over the, uh, the, the the reference, we see that it has a type, and it has a reference attribute, and that says, well, if we uh, what is it command uh, click on it, then we navigate to the from the reference to the declaration. And what is this resolve var? Well, that is a predicate that is uh, that is defined uh, here, and that is a, that is doing a query. So it queries for the var relation. It uses a certain uh, uh, path well fortness predicate. So it says you can go through a bunch of edges and we'll look at those edges later. Then it, it will arrive at some declaration and it will test if that declaration, so one of these things uh, has the name we're looking for, right? So if the, the X prime, the name of the declaration has the same name as the name we're looking for. So that's this equation. It has some path specificity constraints, we'll look at that later as well. And we do that in, in S, so the, sco the, the scope in which the, the variable lives. And then it returns a bunch of query results, um, which I've called P's uh, for, for paths. And so I'm, I'm unifying here on the result and I say, the result of this query should exactly have one tuple, uh, there should be one definition, it's, and, it's, and its type is T, uh, by definition of the query, x prime and x will the same name, but different occurrences of the name. And I'm returning this type t. So let, let's uh, uh, build this and see what uh, the behavior is. Could you please comment on this uh, scope? I mean, uh, you declare a relation bar like without any reference to, to a scope, but then uh, you kind of insert facts into this relation with relation to given scope S and query again with respect to some given scope S. Where are you missing uh, scope? Like how that works. Why, why when you declare var, uh, signature does not mention scope, but then it's somehow related to scope. You can use this. Okay, so, so let's, let's see if we can... S. Yeah. So I no so for for this for declare var. Yeah. I, I understand. I see that. I mean the relation var itself. That one, kind of on the third. Oh, uh, row. I see. So why? How is this thing related? Is that to scope? Yeah. That is what you're. Okay. Yeah. Right. So these relations are scoped. So they live in a scope, by by definition. Uh, so each of these relations uh, is that. The, do I explain that right, Hendrik? I was answering a different question, so okay. I missed what you were talking about. So, so okay. So, what Alexander was saying, where does this in S come from? While I'm not, you're not mentioning scopes in the declaration of the relation. Uh huh. And I said, well, these relations always are scoped, so they live in a scope. They're associated with a scope. Yeah. Right. I mean, that is the. Yeah, uh, that's indeed. So they, there's no there's no sort of global place where these relations live. They always are associated with a scope. Does that make sense, Alexander? Yeah. Okay. Then, yeah, that makes sense. Okay. I mean, I figured out that the scope kind of type is, anyway, built-in special type. That's right. And yes. Yeah, yes. it gets tracked automatically. 
No, I mean, I, I'm, I'm passing the scope no. to this predicate, right? And, and yeah, no, this I, I see, yeah. yeah. Um, so there's a scope. I mean, this says, well, I'm resolving, I'm looking at the, the variable in some scope and I'm, this declaration lives in some scope. I mean, right, I mean, so I'm passing that scope around uh, explicitly. So, uh, Alexander, if you think about the scopes, um, and perhaps you know, it makes sense to show a picture in the near future. Uh -huh. um, that might well, clear up some things, I guess. Um, well, I personally know what you mean because uh, I read the scope graphs paper. Oh, I see. Okay, now in that in that case, but perhaps for other people it might yeah. might be enlightening because the scopes really are just sort of identities in uh, in the graph. Um, so they're they're not sort of directly a collection of things, which might be the intuitive understanding yeah, from different. Uh, frameworks. Okay, so um, so what I've defined is when I define a variable, I, I add a relation to the scope. When I use a variable, I, uh, I do this query, so I look up its declaration, and that allows me to, to navigate from the reference to the declaration, and it gives me the type of that variable, right? It's the same type as there. So if I, if I uh, make this a different type, right? I mean, if I make A a bool, then this becomes a uh, bool and I get a big, big ugly error. Uh, let's see. Uh, it still says int because that's what I is expecting, I guess, uh, Hendrik. Um, um, all right. Um, can I just real yes, quick again? Go ahead. Um, I know you, uh, you just sort of <laughs> talked about the big ugly error and I, I hate to hammer on this but this is sort of one of the things that like in in well, a language and building a language yes. error messages are sort of a uh, the part of your ux right they're part of how yes no uh, okay so let me let me let me correct is there that. a way to make it not big yeah enough? so actually this is not a big ugly error this is a big ugly trace uh, so this is a, so the okay. constraints solving failed and uh, as debugging outputs what you get here is a trace and this is not typically what we want to necessarily what we want to show to users, but uh, when sort of debugging our, our definition, this is what we, well, this is not necessarily what we want to look at, but, but <laughs> this is a trace of the, uh, of the constraint solver and where it got stuck, right? I mean, uh, I here, and uh, you also want to display an error message. And, um, but, but that is definitely an area where we can, um, where we want to do more work, uh, where we have done, okay. uh, uh, yes. Um, I noticed that you're interested in errors, uh, in both in parsing and in type checking. That's uh, it's uh, it's consistent. It's, I find it's a it's a um, necessary feature for any sort of mature language, right? Yes, I I, I fully agree. Um, so. Okay, so what have we here? We have a, uh, let's say, um, we, now we have two definitions of A uh, and we still, we get an error at, uh, at A and, and well, um, it will actually, well, it will actually not resolve because what, what we have seen here is that what I've asked to, for the type of a variable, it says, give me a list with exactly one type or with actually with exactly one resolution. And that fails because now I have introduced two definitions of A's and, and that is, uh, well, it's an error. Uh, we want to be able to deal with programs with errors. And, and um, so, um, so yes. yes. But, uh, given, that, given that declare var already had this constraint that uh, X and T is not an S, um, I would have expected- Oh, oh this, that is not an, this, is, this is not a not, this is an assertion. Oh, this is an assertion. Ah. This is in at. Okay. This thing is in S. Mm -hmm. Yes. Sorry. So I never but, mind. but you I... were saying, but you wanted to say. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. I would have expected that error to be on the sef second definition of A, right? Being, right. Saying, well, telling me that uh, right. this is a redefinition that shouldn't happen. Right. Well, okay. So first of all, this says just there is a declaration in that scope. And it is for this particular occurrence of X, and it's fine to have more of those. I mean, you, of, you, with the same, with the same name. 
Uh, Hendrik, how, how is this actually treated these days? Now that we don't have occurrences anymore? Sorry, uh, how is not true? <laughs> I, I'm, 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 I'm involved in a discussion on Hindley Milner in Slack, so I'm a bit distracted. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Multi multiple uh, relations with the same name in the same scope. They, they are just fine, right? Uh, but they're distinguished because of the the of the identity of the of the of the identifier uh, beyond the just the string definition. Um, no, if you if you just use a string, it's just a string actually. Um, but this, the the graph has sort of a, a, I don't know how you would call that sort of a multi multi edge semantics or counting semantics. I don't know what the. But then the question is, why do I get an error in this case if I Add two declarations with the same name, where these are just identifiers. Well, because there will be two entries in the graph, and the data and entries will be the same. Yeah, but you're saying they will do. They will be the same entry. Yes, yeah, you you won't be able to distinguish between them, but you will see that there are two. Okay, but that's what I mean. So there are yeah. two that uh, that you yes yeah, yeah exactly yes, and that's okay. So so that's that's why this query fails, but because we resolve var actually returns more than one. So if I make this more permissive and say resolve var with with at least some with at least one result, um, then um, this query will be now will now be fine, and it will point to an arbitrary one of these these things. So, for example, if I would make this uh, true, now it will fail because it will it picks the other one. <laughs> uh, okay, but so what I really want is I want to check, as as Fabian suggested, I want to check that there shouldn't be double def definitions, and and rather than well, this is not a not. This is really so. Really, what I want to say here is that I uh, I don't want it, it, there shouldn't be another definition. So basically, I want to say that uh, resolve var of s in x uh, returns uh, exactly uh, one result um, right and uh, and if that is not the case uh, then i want to um, give an error message let's say duplicate definition of uh, x say um, right, and I'm saying if I, uh, so when I'm defining a variable, I also check that it is, well, I, that there, there, there is, that there should be just one definition. And if there's, and, and, and I know that there is one because that I, I just defined it. And if there's one more, then this, this constraint will fail and I will give this error message. And now I'm getting the right error message, now, namely that, uh, where's the error message? Uh, just uh, a quick question. Yep. Could we uh, kind of swap the lines and first check that there are no definitions and then insert the new one? Um, okay, let's try. Um, but now you have to match against empty list. Ah, okay. I see. Uh, but then, right, so if it's empty, but then we shouldn't give an error message, I, I guess, right? Uh, no, if it's not empty, you still get, uh, give error message that, okay, it's not empty, so we have duplicate definitions. Right. Uh, so, so what should I match for empty list or non-empty list? If we first match in, we should match for empty list. And on after that, add new definition. Right. And still okay. have, have an error if we matched and it's not empty. Yeah, okay. So okay, so we keep the error, right? Yeah. Okay. Oh, wait, so, so, are the rules does the it work well? I'm sorry? S say again, Fabian. Sorry, are the, uh, is this this stateful? Like, no, like no, are they no. executed in this direction? And no, it isn't. Not? So that's 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 why I was uh, uh, so now what we get is we get uh, all errors, right? Because the order of constraints really doesn't matter. 
so they're just constraints. They, they can, the, the order doesn't matter. It's not like first check this and then uh, do something. Uh, it is, this is the case, right? And, and that means that even after uh, so the, the, say after we've added this definition, this should be the case. That is the and that, that and that the thing that is the case is that when we have added this thing, there should be exactly one definition of this name. And whether we first do that or or later, that doesn't matter, uh, right? Because when we encounter the first definition, there's there's zero. Well, so the the order doesn't matter. Right? So you should uh, get that. Uh, why are we getting an error now? Um, ah, there it goes away, right? So, really, the order doesn't matter. That's that's an important uh, an important property. Um, and the other thing is, I've made this uh, resolution uh, uh, permissive, right? So it it also succeeds if there's more than one definition, and it just gives me back um, a, a random one of those definitions and it will and it will succeed and apparently now it picked the uh, the one where a is an int and that's fine and it ignores the true but you cannot count on this uh is I it possible that... oh, sorry yes go ahead okay, yeah is it possible to define some like sub scope or scope of this tag of excellent scope? yes that's a good question right because because what i've done here is this still works if uh, the, de the definitions are the other way, right? So these definitions are just a bunch of definitions and there's no order in them, at least, supposedly. Um, Actually, my question well, is- Well, okay, so, right, so, so we don't have definition before use. Um, um, so in this, in this language, we have a bunch of definitions or declarations and they're mutually recursive. They can refer to each other, right? I can even say, uh, uh, I can say this. And uh, at least for the type checker, this is fine. We might want to, uh, 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 we may frown on, upon such uh, mutual recursion, but, but uh, right, but this is, uh, for the type checker, there's no, there's no, there's no problem here. Uh, but well, sometimes we want to have scope shadowing, right? So how how about that? So let's look at uh, lead bindings. Um, so I have added lead bindings, and there's something like uh, this: let a equals one in a plus one, uh, and then uh, so let's say we have def. Uh, now we can refer to B, right? And we, now we can. Uh, so we have a we have a, uh, a scope, uh, but if I, uh, I I can refer to B in this scope, but I cannot refer to uh, to A in this scope, right? So, um, oh well. <laughs> <laughs> So this this language is multi-file. So actually, there is a file that is not in a module, and and so at the top level, there's a declaration of of an A in. Uh, so let me let me. Uh, but it still confirms what you said. You cannot refer to A in the same file in the lead binding. It only refers to that, that's another right. A in another file, and it's not a lead binding. Yes. Um, Why do I write modules with a with a capital? Um, okay, so these these are actually the the uh, what's my file with examples of of lead bindings. So um, right uh, in a lead, uh, this is a sequential lead. So I can refer to uh, to an earlier binding, um, but if I uh, but and I can shadow that binding. Right, so the the X in the body here refers to the uh, the innermost. X and not to the outermost X. So this one shadows that one. Um, I have a parallel let here. So that says uh, I define these things in, uh, in parallel. And so I cannot, if I add an X, it becomes a duplicate definition. Uh, but uh, the A, yeah, so all variables I use here are, go outside. 
uh, and a recursive let, well, that's actually where you have mutual recursion. So um, they can, there's no definition before use, right? I mean, I can refer to the early definition, but also to the, to the later definition. Um, okay, so let's, let's have a see, let's look at how that, uh, how that works. Uh, so let's look at the let.static file. Um, so in the syntax, um, yeah, so let's, let's have a brief look at the syntax here. Um, so I've defined a couple of let constructs. So I have let, so all, they all share the same syntax, right? So I have a let with a, with a list of bindings and bindings are, well, it's the same bindings as we saw before, right? So as, as, the, as the ones in the devs. Um, and they're separated by semicolons, and, but, and they, they, sh they differ in the, the keywords. Let is, is sequential let, parallel let, and a recursive let. Um, okay, so, uh, so what we need to do is define the predicate type of exp for each of these things. And uh, okay, so for this, this is not actually part of the syntax, but I've just faked a, uh, a, a, a let with one binding here, right? So that, that it says binds an expression to an identifier in a body. And uh, that would look something like, uh, something like this. I haven't actually added it to the syntax. Uh, but what we would do is we type the expression of the, uh, what do we call this thing? The bindy, uh, the binded, the bounce. Uh, I don't know, the initializer of the, of the variable. That gives us some type S. Then we introduce a new scope called s let and, and we add an edge from the let scope to the surrounding scope s. Uh, we then we declare in that new scope, we declare x as, a, as an identifier with type s, just as we declared variables before. And then we type check the body of the expression in uh, the new scope s. And that will mean that in this, in this uh, body, the new variable x will be uh, will be visible, but not in the scope uh, in the scope S, right? And that's why we get the the let is a is an is a container. We cannot you cannot go outside it. I see. So the new is the way to define the subscope, or a new and the dash p arrow is a way to define the subscope. That's right. That's right. So a new creates a new scope, a new unique scope. And this edge uh, defines the visibility relation. Namely, everything from the the let scope can see the s scope, but not the other way around. Basically, that's uh, and I'm I'm using p as an as a label on the edge, uh, and we'll see later. That we can use we can define visibility policies using these these edges. And then um, the the different flavors of lets are basically variations on this on this theme. Right, so instead of so the, this this let basically is a sequential let you could you could nest it right, uh, and that has the same effect as let seek, um, and what we are doing here is we're defining we're using uh, s binds okay, to go through the sequence of uh, of let statements, and so basically what we're doing when we right so we binds is a list of bindings, and um, when we reach the end, or when the, the list of bindings is empty, we create an, uh, an edge from the final scope to the surrounding scope. And for each, and then if we go through the bindings, then say we say, well, for each binding, right? For each 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 of these bindings, we create a new scope, match it to the uh, to the surrounding scope, uh, do the bind okay for that scope, right? Where we uh, bind the, 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 the variable introduced is bound to the, to the new scope. Um, but the expression is evaluated in the outer scope, right? So if we look here, the, um, how can we, how can I explain that? Right, so if I would make this, does it make sense? Is S bound? No, <laughs> to yet another module. Um, let me introduce a dev x is three here, right? If I 
uh, the X here is bound to the outside uh, scope and not to the X itself. Um, right, Just so the, the right hand side of a binding is uh, in, in a sequential net is bound to the, uh, to the outer scope. Uh, so this one, and this is the, the one that the variable is bound to. And then we do the same for the, the, less, the rest of the bindings. So basically for a sequential net, we're binding up a chain of, uh, uh, of scopes. Uh, I'll, I'll show a picture in a, in a bit. Can scopes nest? Yes, that's exactly, we're exactly nesting scopes. Ah, but we don't, okay. So I think I'm, I'm going to switch to slides for a little bit to, to show uh, some pictures because that's, uh, I think that helps. Um, All right. Um, right. We've looked at these these kinds of definitions before, right? And basically, these definitions all are well. They're in a bag. They're all in a, in one scope. They're in a big bag. And and so basically, the the picture we get is. Uh, we have a scope and we have a couple of definitions in them and we have a, a bunch of references and those references are resolved in the scope. Basically, when I use uh, a variable A over here, I resolve it uh, from the reference to the, to the definition. Uh, and et cetera, right? So I mean, I think that's, uh, uh, but now let's look at this nesting, at lexical scope. And basically the picture we get here is this, but if we have a bunch of lets, uh, so this is this would be this the, the well, we, for each let we introduce a new scope, uh, and the binding is associated with that scope, and now in the body of the of the let, we uh, we resolve these names, right? So and and that is a matter of finding a path to a scope uh, that has that name along edges in the scope graph, right? So that is how we uh, how we uh, represent this kind of nesting. So the relation we saw is this thing, right? So we say uh, A is a name that has a type and it's associated with a scope. And subscoping is this notion of, of edges between scopes, right? It's saying from scope two, we can reach scope one by this P edge, but not the other way around, right? So in the scope of this let, we cannot see the definition C uh, below. And, um, so then if we look at, uh, yeah, yeah. So then, then we have a couple of, so then you want to think about scoping. Uh, so let's think about duplicate names again. Um, so, okay, so we have these path, path well formless constraints and here I'm using a little bit different syntax but basically in the name resolution query, you have to state, well, I, can resolve through a path of a particular form. And here we're saying for lexical scopes is we can resolve through a, uh, a number of paths, zero or more paths, uh, edges that are labeled with the P edge, uh, where P stands for lexical parent. And it means I can resolve B to the scope here and A to the scope here and C to the scope and uh, C. But now let's look at, at uh, duplicate definitions again. Right, so now we have this uh, let bindings here where we have two definitions of, uh, of A. Uh, in our previous definition, we said, well, if there's, we, we, we don't allow duplicate definitions, right? So that, that would be an error, right? When we do a, a definition, we, we tested whether when, that there was no other definition in scope. And, and so that this A would be a, an error. Actually in LEDs, well, we know we want to allow that because we say, well, the inner LED shadows or the, the inner A shadows the outer A, right? I mean, that's the whole idea of a LED. Um, so, uh, so without that policy, we basically we get these paths, right? So we say A resolves to, um, to this A, but it can also resolve to this A. And when we defining a path, we were also doing a resolution, right? So we're saying A resolves to itself and A resolves to this A. Uh, but now we want to add a shallow shadowing policy, and that's where 
uh, path specificity comes in. So basically what we want to say here is we want to, we prefer the closer, uh, the, the shorter path over the longer path, right? So the, uh, this A is should be resolved to this A and this A should resolve to itself basically. Um, so this is what we want, the situation we want. And we express that using a path specificity ordering. And here we're saying dollar less than P that says the path with no edges is preferable over a path with, uh, with one P edge. And then you can transitively close that and then you say a, a path with, uh, with fewer P's uh, is preferable over a path with more, with, with more P's. And that's how we express uh, shadowing in scope graphs. Does that make sense? People yeah. on, yeah? Yep. <laughs> Thanks, uh, Doc. Uh, um, okay, do we want to go back to the experiment or do we want to stay in slides? And what's the next topic? What's the next topic? So in the slides, the, the question is, how about non-lexical binding, right? So, uh, and I think it will be, uh, I'll, I'll go back to the to Eclipse and, uh, and show some experiments. And then we can go back to um, um, slides if we want to see more pictures. Um, so yeah, so is this, is this idea, clear how we model lexical scope? Uh, yes. I heard a question. No. Okay. Um, so then let's look at um, yeah, functions are boring. Uh, let's look at uh, let's look at modules. Um, Modules. And maybe I do some sandbox experiments here. Um, module A, module B. So what are modules? Modules are basically uh, containers of things. And uh, so I can put a uh, a definition in a module, and it will be uh, it will be encapsulated. Um, so now, if I would try to refer to these things, that would be that would be that would be fail, right? I mean, there's no these things are not visible. Um, and now, let's say if I wanted to uh, do a computation here where I access A. Well, then I need to, uh, I, I could, for example, import, uh, import module A. And now I can resolve to, uh, to the A definition in the other scope. So basically modules are scope thingies. Uh, and, and, and well, in general, scope thingies are containers that, that contain stuff. And, and they're invisible from outside unless you, you have an edge into the, into the scope. That is the general, the general concept. And uh, so I've just shown that how that how to use scopes and edges for to to model lexical scope, but it can just be uh, as well dealt. Uh, we can use it to to deal with uh, modules. And uh, for example, uh, we could do uh, computationally. This may not. I mean, someone may figure out how to do this computationally, but um, uh, imports. It's called here. All right now, I do. Uh, I have mutual recursion, so I uh, module A imports B and A imports uh, B imports A, and so I can uh, go uh, uh, I can in both go in both directions, for example. Um, and well, I mean this doesn't make a lot of sense for for these, but it now suppose these are uh, uh, are functions, and and that is an example I have uh, I have here. Um, That's to no, I did. Uh, 
where are my alts and evens? Um, anyway, um, That's not alt, right? And, uh, right, so now we have nice mutual recursion um, and where we uh, can call functions from uh, from other modules, and et cetera. Okay, so let, let's see how, how, we can, uh, how we can model this. Um, so we introduce a... Uh, so-called uh, scope as type. So basically we're going to use scopes in type. So we mod is a constructor that takes a scope and produces a, uh, a, a type and we'll see how that works. Um, okay, so when we encounter a module as a declaration, then, uh, well, we want to declare it. And uh, so we have, just like we declared variables, I've, I've, it's a different namespace, right? So we cannot, uh, I can, uh, define uh, big A, capital A, as a variable, and that's a different uh, that's a different namespace. So let's say. Um, so therefore, I have uh, it. It's completely separate from uh, from modules. So therefore, I've defined a, a separate name declaration and resolution strategy for it. Okay, so what I do is uh, for to declare a module, I define a new scope as mod to represent the module. I make an edge because uh, modules have lexical scope. For example, if I uh, uh, define uh, something like this, um, right, then uh, I can reach the lexical scope of a, of a module. So I make an edge from the module scope to the uh, to the uh, to the surrounding scope, and I, I declare that the module name is associated with the type mod of uh, that scope. Oh, well, of a scope. Um, it's actually called uh, yeah. So I've okay, but uh, and and then I'm going to check uh, the members. Uh, of the scope uh, of the, of the of the module and and for each member, um, okay. And basically, the, the so what I have introduced here is a notion of um, sequential composition. So I can uh, I can import uh, things in order, just like the let is in order. Um, um, and we'll see in a bit why that is uh, why that is necessary. Uh, but basically. Okay. Can I do a sort of interjection? Sure. Uh, there, there seems to be some confusion on what a non-lexical scope is. So some people thought that was basically dynamic scoping that happens at runtime on the project. Right. Would be good to clarify that. Yes. Um, what is a non-lexical scope? So uh, in in a lexical scope, uh, in our def understanding, lexical scope is is tree-like, right? So in in a let binding. Uh, we introduce a new scope, and then every and then everything above it is visible in the in the uh, in the scope. But uh, uh, and, and scoping mm -hmm. proceeds downwards. In with non-lexical binding or non-lexical scoping, we mean things like uh, sideways scoping. Right? You could have two lexical scope trees, and then import something from the one scope tree into the other scope tree, like you have in in modules, right? I mean, so this module has a has a lexical scope, as so it has a uh, its outer scope uh, defines things like outer, but it also imports things from uh, sideways. Um, is that a uh, useful explanation? Maybe you can try better, uh, Hendrik. No, I think it's fine. I'll see if more questions are raised. Okay. And then, uh, okay. Let me let I me know if that was not. Um, um, 
Okay, so so what do we do when we check these members? Basically, members is a list of uh, of members that are uh, uh, sections of declarations, and for each section of declaration, we just do the decals, okay, that we did before, and and those are mutually recursive. Um, so um, module rec. Um, so def A is B and def B is A, right? And those things are mutually recursive as we saw before, but if we make uh, if we make this a sequential composition, then suddenly we get definition before you. So now we can refer to A, but we cannot refer forward. So basically we get sections of uh, definitions that are within themselves mutually recursive, but they're not, uh, but otherwise they're in, but, uh, Inter-declaration sections are, are definition before use. That's, uh, let's call it like that. Um, right, and so there's an edge from a section to its previous section, but not the other way around. Um, okay, so that's just a, a module, is just a bunch of uh, imports, but is now that we have a, a sequence of such definitions, we end up with the body like we did in the, the let Basically, the, the, the body of a module becomes a sequence of bindings like, like we had in, uh, in LED bindings. At the end comes a scope, and that is basically the, what the module provides, right? I mean, everything that's visible at the end. Uh, because if we, uh, uh, we have a module uh, use that uh, imports rec, then we can uh, use both uh, A and B. But it's as if, um, does that make sense? I keep writing imports. Um, because in REC, uh, you Oh, have actually this doesn't work. Okay, so I've, I haven't completely That's thought this okay. through uh, because we have a policy that says don't visit parent edges after you visit import edges. Um, so let me tweak this a bit. Um, um, but your rec model is ill-defined. It does not like type check because you have sequential composition there and you have four words. Yeah, no, okay, okay. But let me let me just do it like this. Um, then you would still expect that uh, you can reach uh, A. And um, um, like that. And then we look at variables. And now we can... Um, This is uh, rather improvised, so I'm not sure that this uh, that this makes sense. Um, Hendrik, help me out. So the, the policy here, as I say, after a import edge, I can still, oh, but I didn't, I didn't save that. Okay. All right, let's not get distracted. I, I will. Uh, uh, yeah, so the, the, the idea of the design should be that uh, everything in this module should be available to, to clients. Um, uh, okay, I will come back to this. Uh, I, I want to de debug this, uh, but this may be after the session because. Um, uh, yeah. We have we have encoded things like that before, but yeah, yeah, can be, yeah, it, can be yeah, a bit tricky to get it right. It should work, uh, but I mean, 
I've been thinking about all these things that I'm showing for, uh, I mean, for for a long time, and uh, uh, improvising these things doesn't necessarily work so easily. Um, right. Okay. Uh, I think the basic idea is is correct. But okay, so let's but let's focus on on imports. So how does import work? Um, so rec is just another name that resolves to this uh, to this module. And um, so when I define uh, imports, then um, well, actually I can well, it can be a, a path, but uh, the basic idea is the the type uh, of this name should resolve. Uh, I mean, this name should resolve to a type uh, to a mod type, uh, and that type has a scope. And so what I do here is I construct an edge from the scope of the module to uh, the imported scope, right? So this module has a scope. Its type is uh, well. If we look at it, it's a, it's a mod with a with a scope in it. If I create an import, then I create an edge from the scope that I'm defining here to the scope that I'm uh, that I'm importing. And then our resolution policy for variables shows us that we can resolve. Uh, true such uh, true parent scopes uh, edges, but also true uh, true import uh, import edges. What what does that mean? What does the that bar mean between the R star and I star? Say again. What does that? Pipe mean between the R ah, and I. So th th this is just regular expressions. So this is saying the the paths for for variables should be zero or one P edges, followed by zero or one R edges or zero or one I edges. It's zero or more edges. Zero zero or more. Sorry, clean star, uh, followed by zero or one or, or more uh, M edges. I see. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I would expect that the scope for A would be an import edge followed by an M edge, right? All right, anyway. Right, so import is just a matter of making a new uh, a new scope, but the, the what is different with uh, with let bindings, right? So in, in let bindings, we saw the syntactic structure of the program uh, created the, the scope structure. And, um, and so basically it's in lexical scope, the scope structure follows the tree structure of the, of the program. Uh, whereas in, in this kind of non-lexical binding, what we see is that, um, well, we go from this tree, the, the tree of the use module to the tree of the rec module by basically creating an edge uh, in between those uh, those tree structures. And, and furthermore, that edge is is resolution dependent, right? So, or, or type dependent. So the, uh, uh, rather than structure of the program dependence. In order to create this edge, we need to, uh, create an edge to the uh, to the other edge. Maybe I should show some pictures uh, at this at this point. Um, questions? I'll I'll show some pictures. Um, Um, right, so, so here we saw basically what we just saw, right? So, so we have a module uh, A, which is itself a declaration. We have a module B, which is itself a declaration. And then uh, each of these things, these modules have a type uh, and that is associated with a, with a scope. And in that scope, that's just a container of declarations like, uh, like A and B. 
um, and um, right. And and then we have this import, and the import is itself uh, also just a name that we resolve in the scope that it is uh, declared in, and that resolves to a name in the in the outer scope in this case, the type which is uh, a mod of a scope, scope two in this case, and then what we do is create an edge from the scope of the A module to the scope of the, the B module. And, uh, and given that, we can then resolve uh, uh, B to the, uh, to, uh, yeah, so B to the definition of module B and C again using the, the lexical scope parent path to the, to the outer scope. And now I'm saying, uh, I'm, 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 I'm uh, sort of, uh, explaining this very operationally, right? So, so we we resolve this name and then we add this edge and then we do this other thing. But really the semantics of statics is such that uh, the resolution of these queries should hold also in this final stage, right? If we, if we have this final scope graph, then we should be able to redo these queries and get the same results. Uh, so if we re resolve the, the B reference again, then again, it would resolve to this, to this, B, uh, to this B declaration. And so that is not uh, always the case. Okay, so so yeah, so then we get uh, um, um, what's the word, uh, right? If we if we if we have shadowing, right? So, so now we can have shadowing. We saw before we have shadowing, where we have one path, right? So there was in in the let we have a path to an outer scope, to an outer scope, to an outer scope, and then we say resolve to the. Uh, to the nearest scope, that is the, because that shadows declarations in outer scopes. Here we see that we can resolve B to two e different edges, right? I mean, the, 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 the paths in the resolution graph uh, fork, we can resolve things in the parent scope or we can resolve th things in the, in the imported module. And if you have two names, uh, the same name defined in both places, then we need to choose what 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 do we do? Well, one choice could be well, you couldn't cannot have such conflicts, right? I mean, some languages do that. Another choice could be uh, well, uh, we prefer imports, things we import, shadow things we have from our lexical scope, for example. And that is the policy we choose here: it's a uh, import, choose import over parent, and then we get uh, uh, we prefer the blue path over the red path. And it also works with with mutual recursion, right? So mutual recursion is just a matter of um, adding, uh, I mean, we can re re do the import in both ways. It just will add import edges, and then we can resolve other things. And that is not uh, a matter of uh, there's no cycles or anything that uh, that 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 uh, are constructed. This is just a model, uh, the final model in which we can do uh, queries. Um, all right. Um, and this works for for uh, transitive imports, right? So for example, here I have module A that imports B, which imports C. So I get multiple import edges, and now I can resolve a name like uh, like C over here uh, through this chain of import edges to its uh, definition in uh, further on. And again, this is uh, allowed by this uh, I star. A filter that says I've uh, resolved through one or more, zero or more import edges. If I would just do that I, I question mark, then I would not have transitive imports, right? And so using these policies, I can play with uh, resolution policies and, and define visibility policies. Um, right, and so, and these queries need to be stable. So, the result I get from the query should be the same in the final scope graph. It's not like I resolve this query, then I add an edge and I do some other res resolutions. I, if I would resolve that query again after adding the edge, I should get the same result. And that is not always the case. For example, um, here we have modules, right? So we have a, um, um, a module B nested in A, right? So that, that leads to uh, a declaration of A that has a module and that declaration has a, mo a declaration of B, which has a, a module scope uh, there. And then we have a module C that uh, first imports A, 
and then imports B. Well, I say first, but it, in, it imports both A and B, basically, right? Um, and so what you might think is, well, I this A resolves here, so I add an I edge to, to this scope. Uh, this B then resolves uh, through that I edge, and uh, therefore I get uh, it resolves to this B, and therefore I add an, an I an I edge to uh, from the A the uh, from the C scope to the to the B scope, and then I can resolve the B within the uh, uh, the B scope to uh, uh, to this declaration over here. Now this seems fine, right? Um, but now let's consider this scenario. So I have renamed the nested module to also be named A. Okay. So I can I can go through the same uh, process and say, well, I first I, I import A twice now. So now I, I resolve A to the outer A. Then I add an, an I edge. Um, and now I can resolve the second A to, to this one, right? Uh, and then I add an I edge. But actually, that makes uh, the model, uh, it, well, maybe it's already, uh, actually before adding this I edge, it, it also already becomes problematic, right? Because uh, once I add this I edge, then this outer A could now be resolved to this inner A. So the query, the initial query for this import is not is not stable. I could have, uh, I could, uh, I can reinterpret it. Um, so that's why I introduced this notion of the the semicolon in in uh, declaration sections, uh, because now I get a section in which I do the import. Right. So this, uh, I now have an uh, uh, an import of a. That that I resolve, and then I add an I edge, but it's not the I edge is not added in this scope, but in the in the next scope, basically. Um, um, so the picture is not right, actually. <laughs> um, I need to redraw this picture. So there's a scope in between here, and the I edge edge should be added to to that scope. And then I can resolve this. Uh, oh, the picture is completely wrong, actually. Okay. Um, but yeah, so mm, ah, I cannot redraw this. But basically, uh, this I edge should go from uh, from this scope. Then I can resolve the second uh, A uh, to this A. And then there should be yet another scope. And that should um, have the import edge to the, to the next module. It was a nice picture, but I, yeah. I think the, the picture is right, but the numbering is kind of unexpected. Mm. If you follow numbers of the modules, like they, they seem right and that just seem right. No, but the, the, I mean, the problem here is in this, in this graph, I can still resolve this A to the inner A, right? I mean, the, uh, there should be a, a, a scope in between that in, in which this uh, I edge is drawn actually. But the, this I edge here is still uh, the same as it, as it was in the, as in the previous in the previous picture. Yeah, all right. That edge is wrong. Yeah. Um, all right. So this is a bit rough. Um, okay. Questions. You're very brave because we have been at this for three hours and 40 minutes already. So that's, uh, it's pretty impressive that there's uh, still people left. That is, uh, I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I'm really glad. Um, okay, so there's, there's one more example I wanted to show. Um, it was this one. Um, yeah, so I had, on the slides I had a thing called permission to extend, but the example I gave there wasn't very good. Um, so what I did with this language, I extended it with a uh, with this feature, uh, extend remote. 
And um, so what this does is it says something like, uh, I have a module a client uh, and I'm, uh, well, I, I think that module A is, uh, is pretty good, but it's not, it's not good enough. I want to, I want to add something to it. So I want to say, uh, Module A really needs an increment uh, function. So I, I'm i adding that to it. Um, and uh, and actually it's an, it's a sort of assignment syntax. So, so basically I'm, I'm saying I want to, I want to uh, extend the definitions of module A with the new definition. Um, it's something that language designers do, right? Um, uh, so maybe you have an opinion. Is this a good idea? Uh, well, lately extensions, extension methods are, are really popular, though they implement them, them on types, not on modules, but in scope graphs model. Right. You basically don't have distinction between models and types or classes. So yeah, right. that's that's uh, in the trend. Yeah, really necessary feature. Um, okay. Um, right. Okay. So 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 here's a, my proposal to. Uh, to implement this feature. So the, the abstract syntax is extend remote, right? And it has a, a path and then a name. And uh, so what I do is I resolve that path that gives me a uh, a, a module type. Then I, I, I type check the, uh, the expression that gives me a, a T. And then I want to say, well, declare uh, in as mod, right? The remote module declare uh, this thing with this type, and here I get a uh, an, uh, a type error from uh, from statics, and it says uh, scope missing permission to be extended with with var, and um, um, and this is a uh, an important feature of uh, uh, so, so yeah so basically so what is going on here I I basically have used a query here right so the type of path. Uh, it, it's a bit hidden, but basically what type of path does, it, it, it resolves the name A, right? Um, let me actually try to build it. Oh, it will not line, uh, it will not have, mm. I mean, I can, I suppose I can build it without, uh, without this feature. Um, Um, right now, I basically A becomes a reference to the module that I want to extend, and Inc is a new name. Uh, and uh, so this is a query that will result in, a, in such a model, module type. And in the semantics of statics, uh, I need to own a scope in order to be able to extend it. Right? And extend means doing things like declare, declare a variable, add a, a relation to that, uh, to that scope, or add an edge to that scope, so an outgoing edge. I can always make an edge into the scope, right? I can, I can do a query as I do for imports. I get a, a scope and I create a, an edge to that scope, but I cannot add an edge to the scope going outside. And why is that? Well, that would really affect the stability of queries, right? If I if I would, yeah, I do all kinds of name resolution and I uh, and then I suddenly add an edge to that uh, to that scope, or I add a declaration that would. Uh, capture that might capture all kinds of names that I had resolved before, and that would mess things up. Uh, and therefore, this is uh, this this is not allowed. Um, do you want to add anything to that explanation, Hendrik? Or are you still in Hindley Miller land? No, half with with one leg. <laughs> but, uh, I, I don't have to add anything. To that, I think. Okay. Um, it it all seems to make sense. Sorry. Um, because, like, I mean, usually when you have extension methods or so on, you need to you need to import them from the module that they're defined in. They are not like magically added to the thing that to, they're defined. Yeah, on. right. With this design, right? I mean, they would be extended globally. Everyone who would see the original module A 
would now suddenly have this ink method. That is something different and say, well, for my local use, I want to add, extend this type with something new, right? I mean, you could model that differently saying, well, I want to, I want to, uh, I don't know, extend a width uh, and then for the local purposes that I would have that uh, extension method. And um, yeah, so another place where you would might think that you need such a feature is in partial classes, right? In, in C sharp, you can define classes in multiple files. And then you say, well, a natural way to implement is that there's one scope for that class. And I, every, from everywhere, I, I, I throw things into that, into the bag. Um, so basically how we would model that is say, each of those partial classes has its own scope, but they import each other. And that, that allows us to, um, to well, get this, um, uh, the visibility, right? I mean, if I, if I say that, um, uh, here that that module A imports clients, uh, well, then it's visible for everyone that um, that client has an ink uh, or that A has an ink method, right? I mean, that that, um, uh, that would be a natural thing. Um, all right. Perhaps so, a uh, critical question in the Spoofers channel. Okay. Um, what is the critical question? The question is, in Antler, I had to write an imperative black context checker where I had a recursive method to follow the links between scopes. And yet it seems a lot simpler than doing this declaratively. Help me see the error of my ways. Um, Cohen. I had to an imperative context checker. Uh, Well, maybe maybe George can explain why why that is simpler. <laughs> and how do you deal with with uh, mutual recursion, for example, or that is what? Uh... Um, yeah, I don't know. I I mean, without the so, if you. Um, for example, add uh, nesting to these modules, right? I mean, you need to, uh, so basically what you need to do to, to do this kind of checking, you need to build up a, um, an interface of the thing you're, you're ex exporting uh, before you can, you can use it. And you need to be, think carefully about uh, how you build up that interface, what things you need to visit before you can, can use that interface. Uh, what we're doing here is we're, our uh, predicate basically do one visit of the of the tree, uh, declaring uh, the, the things that are available, without having to think about the ordering of things. For example, right. So, for example, here I'm uh, saying um, as soon as I hit the module, I declare that it's uh, that it is that is there, that it has a type. Uh, it, its type is is available even though. I'm still going to add stuff to the uh, to the type. Uh, then I'm going to go on uh, typing that uh, the, the 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 members of that module, uh, where uh, in that module I may need stuff from other modules that uh, that and that are mutually recursive. So if I need do that manually, I need to think carefully about about well visiting the, those modules maybe first, building up an interface and then going back to the module to actually do the so checking the modules, uh, the, the the modules, for example. Um, but maybe George has a um, a different method for that. Um, but so, so I think that is the the uh, the power you get here. You don't have to think about scheduling the the visits uh, of things. You declare that things are available. You declare dependencies between things. And the solver makes sure that it uh, uh, resolves, uh, that it figures out in what order to do things in order to be uh, to be safe. Um, that would be my answer. Anything to add to that, uh, Hendrik? Yeah, it can be a bit um, how to say. Um, when you look at simpler examples of, of scoping, 
But if you model a uh, sort of normal tree-like flexible scoping sort of type environment, traditional type environment in this, uh, as a sort of extreme example, it might look uh, somewhat overblown to set up all this machinery to uh, to make that work, right? because you can understand pretty well how to do lookups in a map and sort of build that map when you traverse your, uh, your tree. Um, but when, when you get sort of very complicated shadowing rules uh, or the mutual recursion between uh, different scopes or things like that, um, I think that's really when uh, you see the advantage of, uh, of using scope graphs instead of trying to to code that yourself. So yeah, there are many patterns that you can probably code yourself quite well and, and you won't cry over it. But I think there are also many patterns where uh, it's uh, absolutely the opposite. Oh, and one gosh. of the nice things is perhaps that's that's a nice thing that um, sort of this is a uniform uh, thing. So actually you can sort of, you approach all the different uh, forms of scoping that you might have sort of they all fit in this uh, in this framework so you don't have to come up with different representations for uh, different kinds of scoping that you, uh, you might have so in that sense it's also a sort of conceptual simplification uh, where you map everything on this on this one concept and that's what you uh, work with which I think is also an adv advantage Other questions? Yes, go ahead. From like uh, this some 3,000 feet view, uh, to me, like one huge uh, advantage I see is uh, declarativity and those modularity, those additivity of the statics. So you kind of specified your lexical scoping rules, for instance, yeah, lexical scoping checking and then you can like forget about that and do this model sheet module system and all the complicated rules for models without any consideration of these other rules for uh, lexical scoping or whatever you have there or for yeah types when you model types like classes with the same scope graphs uh, it works with modules kind of seamlessly. So you separate everything uh, and you specify everything separately and then it yeah, just gets resolved uh, thanks to this automatic uh, constraint solver. And you don't have to update like old code to take into account these new stuff you added later to your language uh, and yeah stuff like that though again uh, on that note it would be interesting to see some examples of uh, types modeled with the scope graphs in statics if we have time for that uh right okay um let's have a quick look at records uh, that's the only type I've, I've done here. Um, yeah, especially with regard, uh, with regard to the subtyping relation and how. Yeah, and so I, I've, I haven't done, um, yeah, uh, fancy type, subtyping. I've only done uh, subtyping with null. Uh, uh, so let me go there. Um, I was looking for record example. Right, so I have a uh, record, so point is a type that is a record type. Uh, I can uh, instantiate it. Uh, I can uh, uh, project from it, right? So here we see that uh, take the X field from the, the P, uh, from the point records. Um, and these things can, uh, can be recursive. Um, and so on. And uh, again, the idea is that uh, a record type is a is a scope. Uh, using a scope is a type. Um, so rect is a um, 
is one of these things. Um, and basically what we create, do is create a new record, a new scope for the record to represent the record. Uh, and for each field, we add a, uh, we declare the variable uh, in, uh, as a variable in that, uh, in that scope. Um, and then in record construction, right, you want to see that the, uh, a field like this is a, is a reference to the field in the, in the type. And uh, you want to check that all the, uh, um, right, yes, yeah, so this was the error we uh, had. So the, the, the localization of this error was not so useful. Um, but you want to check that um, all the fields have been initialized. Um, and uh, really, the error should, should end up here. That, uh, Right, if this, uh, uh, and you want to check that not, uh, it doesn't have more, uh, more fields than, uh, uh, than you want, or then are declared in the type, and that they have the right, uh, the right type, right? So if uh, um, here we would get some uh, int is bool unification error, um, Um, well, same idea, right? So if we uh, resolve or, or so type construction, that is new construct, we resolve uh, the type that is a, uh, um, a type as a, with a scope. And then we check for all the, the, uh, the, the field bindings that they are uh, correct, right? Order doesn't, uh, doesn't matter here. Um, Correct with respect to the uh, to the type, and we want to check that the uh, the definitions are are complete. Um, so basically, what what I've done here is do a query that says, "Well, give me all the variables that are in scope of um, what is it? In it complete, um, right? So I want to uh, check that the um, all the fields in the type that I'm constructing should also be present in the type that I'm. Uh, that, so this is this scope represents the type that I'm represent the type. And this is the the constructor of the type. So I want to check that all the uh, declarations that occur in the type also occur in the uh, in the constructor. So basically, I'm I I do a query. Uh, so vars in scope uh, does a query that says gives me all the all the variables in this uh, in this scope and uh, where was I and then check that uh, for each of the uh, of the resolution results there check that the constructed uh, scope s uh, also has a has a declaration for that field and otherwise Give an error that it's not uh, not initialized. Yeah. Um, there are two questions, a bit more high level, regarding uh, verification. Uh, perhaps About? before you run out of time, it would uh -huh. be interesting to uh, address those in the spoofex channel. Let me see. The last two. Yeah, export the syntax and semantic definition to a theorem prover such as Isabel so that safety properties can be proved. Um, yes, uh, so I mean these uh, SDF and, and statics are, are formal languages with a, with a syntax so you can translate them, compile them to other languages. Um, so if, if you ask the question, can you export sort of in principle, then, then yes. Uh, if you if the question is, do you have such an exporter? Then the answer is no. Uh, but but that is something you that one could define. I mean, in the past we have done an experiment with uh, extracting cock definitions from um, from SDF and and enable definitions. That's what, that actually led us on the path to um, to this to this whole scope graph uh, theory. 
the other question is, can you model refinement type systems such as in liquid Haskell where there is a subtype check that involves checking implication of the refinement constraints? Um, well, I mean, so in the Uppsala 18 paper, we uh, explore type systems such as structural types and, um, and, and uh, polymorphic types such as system F, where we basically uh, uh, represent bindings at the type level using uh, scopes again. Um, the, uh, maybe I should go back to my slides because I have a few remarks about that. Um, Uh, um, and and so and and it, the idea there is a bit similar to how um, um, parameterization is represented in the dot model for for Scala, right? So where you say take a parameterized uh, class and basically turn the parameter into an abstract uh, type member of that, uh, of that class. And uh, that is the kind of representation we, uh, we have played with in that, uh, in that paper. Um, and that, uh, that worked in, in principle. We, so we, in the paper, we show things like uh, structural typing. Actually, that is, doesn't depend so much on that type. That, that basically depends on scopes as types. But the other represent on or depend on a representation where you add type members to represent type parameters, uh, and we have demonstrated that we could sort of do that. But the representation was a bit was a bit clunky, and so we're not entirely satisfied with that uh, with that model. We would like to get a better representation. And if you ask about refinement type systems. I mean, in principle, uh, I guess um, statics is uh, Turing complete, Hendrik. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so you can do anything. Um, the other question is whether that's a natural, uh, whether it would lead to natural, nice and declarative specifications. And uh, I don't know. I haven't looked at refinement type systems and we haven't tried to, to do those. So I wouldn't... Uh, uh, so my, my first guess is they wouldn't be super uh, nice to start with. So well, I, earlier someone asked um, a question about whether it was possible to basically delegate uh, the decision for a certain predicate to an external solver. So I have a kind of um, right. FFI. I guess for this kind of use case, that might be uh, a good good way to do that if you basically collect the your refinement constraints and maybe pass them to your ST solver assuming that sort of at every individual use site you you can decide that without right having to look at the whole world yes it, right. it depends on some details but that might be a good way of actually uh, doing that right so so an important thing there that that's also related to the the Hindley Milner question or, or point that's on the slides is is the uh, Sort of the the ordering in the solver, which is well, there there is no as a user you don't have control over ordering, and therefore um, uh, and that is something we're we're uh, struggling with at the moment. So we're um, for Hindley Milner, what you want to do? So we do type inference, right? So we have constraint variables. We just say the type of this is a constraint variable, and the type of that is something, and then we unify, and then and then uh, we resolve that, and that is so that gives us type inference. But for Hindley Milner, what you need to do is compute the type of a function which may contain some constraint variables, right? For example, we have fun of x goes to x, and then we just have a constraint variable for x, and then uh, the type becomes um, uh, fun, fun t to t, right? And, but for Hindley Milner, what you then want to do is to generalize over that type and say, well, what are all the free constraint variables in this type? And that in itself is a, a simple operation. Uh, the problem is that uh, has to do with this uh, this lack of control over ordering, which is uh, key for things like well, we 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 want to be more declarative and we don't want to specify ordering. Uh, but for Hindley Miller, you want to know well 
is this really a function from T to T or is it really a function from int to int, right? I mean, was I, uh, I mean, is there still some constraints, some unification constraints lingering, which will make this function more precise? Um, so you need to know whether the constraint variables in a type are really free constraint variables. And uh, in Hindley-Milner Hindley type systems, that is carefully orchestrated in a type system to, to make sure you know that if you, when you type check a, a LED binding, that you know uh, what the free type variables at that point are. You have done all the unification that are relevant at, at that point. Uh, basically, we want to generalize that notion and, and be able to uh, do that kind of generalization in a, in a more generic manner. And um, uh, yeah, figuring out how exactly to do that is, is something we're uh, going to solve tomorrow, right, Hendrik? That's the, uh, that's the plan. Thursday should be done. Right. <laughs> no. I mean, I, 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 was, uh, I was visiting Francois Potier just before the whole Corona thing happened. And, and he was telling me about his approach to, uh, to constraints. And, and, and that approach to, to constraints just works for Henley Milner. And the question is how to generalize it for all kinds of other, uh, other settings. But I have good hope that, that we, can, uh, we can tackle that. Um, yeah, maybe to, to close off some other, uh, or, or, well, before we can have more discussion. Uh, some other things that we're doing is, uh, so Henrik is working on a uh, incremental analysis. So, so as, as I've shown a bit, we do multi-file analysis, right? So you can just, you get multi-file analysis out of the box. But we also want to make this incremental, right? So if you make a change to a file, then not the whole, pro your whole project is reanalyzed again. And uh, so there is a kind of uh, sort of coarse grained uh, incrementality going on currently already. Uh, but we want to, uh, but Henrik is working on a, a much more refined incremental analysis where you basically concurrently analyze files and they uh, exchange information via these scope graphs. And uh, where you want to say, well, if I, if I change this file, uh, what other files do I need to recheck because of these, uh, because, because of these, these changes? So basically the aim is to get dependency analysis out of the box, right? I mean, that is another question if you go back to the Antler file, if you want to do, uh, if you want to have it, if you have a type checker and then want to turn it into an incremental type checker, that typically requires a lot of uh, additional work. Another thing we're working on is code completion, right? So, uh, so now we have constraints that we have interpret that we're interpreting as as a type checker. So, give a program check if it's correct. The other thing is I showed this uh, syntactic code completion, right? Where you say, well, I have this hole in the program. What kind of things can I fill in? That, that is syntactic code completion. We want to extend that, or we're working on extending that to semantic code completion, where I say, well, you cannot just fill in anything that's syntactically valid, but anything that is, but but only some uh, things that are syntactically valid and valid according to the um, the static semantics. And then we can do things like uh, uh, name resolution, right? So what variables can I fill in here that would be in scope, etc. And based on this constraint-based formulation of type systems, we can get these additional kind of interpretations uh, rather than just as a, as a type checker. Similarly, we're working on refactorings and renamings, right? So you want to rename what, what, are, what are all the things that I should rename? Uh, quick fixes. Uh, another interpretation is random term generation, right? So I have a, a type system. Uh, I want to check my compiler. So I want to generate a whole bunch of random programs that are not just syntactically correct, but also type correct and that are interesting. And uh, so that's yet another interpretation of such a declarative, uh, declarative system. So I, I think that is an important difference with a sort of imperative method where you, well, define something that walks over a tree and computes everything that you need for type checking. But then if you uh, want to generate random terms, well, you, you have to write yet another program. Or if I want to do renaming, um, well, you need, you need some other representation. Uh, so that's the goal here to have a single declarative specification that can be, uh, have multiple kinds of, uh, of interpretations. Um, all right, floor is open for discussion uh, or for dinner or something or, or beer. Uh, so now, now we would go to the pub, right? I mean, that's the, uh, that would be nice. Um, 
I think this 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 thing works pretty well. It's uh, it's pretty amazing that I can reach uh, a whole bunch of you all over the world. But it would be nice to uh, to have a chat over a beer now, and that would be. Uh... Anyway, before before uh, before that, are there any any questions Does or comments or? Does this tool include a way to define an uh, operational semantics or some long time system? Yes. Well, so uh, yeah. So I've I've shown two aspects of of SpoofX here. So syntax and static semantics. We also do. We have a language called Shadigo, which is a sort of general purpose term transformation language uh, that I've used to uh, to define interpreters. Uh, we define used to define transformations on programs, uh, etc. It is uh, it is very useful sort of to do pattern matching on trees and uh, to do generic traversals over trees. Uh, it is not uh, as high level as uh, as I would want. Um, so we've been working on we are working on dynamic semantic specifications. So we have had a version called uh, DINSEM, uh, where we basically write kind of operational semantics rules that are then translated to an interpreter. Uh, and we have done experiments with with translating those interpreters to well, interpreting those interpreters in Truffle, the, the Oracle framework, uh, with the hope of getting um, partial evaluation for this. And, and so we got some encouraging results. Um, the main problem with DINSEN was that it uh, did, does big step operational semantics. And if you want to do more fancy things like exceptions or uh, other kinds of effects, that is a bit uh, limiting. So currently we're working on dynamics, um, which is a language for defining the operational semantics uh, that is not quite big step and not quite small step, but where we can uh, define all kinds of effects, uh, exceptions, continuations, uh, etc. Uh, the idea is that, it, that the rules look like a uh, kind of a big step-ish operational semantics, but they can also be interpreted as a uh, as a compiler, basically. And um, well, that's a bit vague, and it's not something you you can download and and write and, and use right away. So, um, um, but that's something we were working on. Um, that was the answer to that question. Yeah, you please, okay, thank uh, you. Maybe you could please uh, say something about the uh, relationship of uh, your approach to effects uh, like exceptions and uh, handlers, algebraic handlers approach to that, which is again pretty much uh, and, uh, like yeah, big step semantic ish. Yes, to me at least. I mean, yeah, uh, another discussion. Uh, uh, so we are we are exploring that kind of space, and we don't have a, uh, we don't have any final uh, final verdicts there. Uh, but so, so Kasper Bach Poulsen is a is an assistant professor in the group, and he's very much interested in algebraic effects and uh, thinks that that is the way to go. So there are some. Uh, we're looking at continuations as a model or algebraic effects or so there are some different schools um, in in our group that uh, different things we're trying um, other questions uh, i was wondering uh, to what extent you have used this in education in delft especially in undergraduate classes for example for program language or compiler course Right, so we're not using it. So we're using it in the master. So in the fourth year of our, uh, so we have a three-year bachelor and a two-year master program, and we're using it in the first year of the master program uh, for the compiler course. And so I teach a compiler course using uh, using SpoofX, and in that course, they uh, each student individually defines, uh, builds a compiler for Mini Java, so with syntax definition, static semantics, and a and a code generator. To uh, to Jasmine, so a bytecode uh, assembly language, um, in the matter in in a uh, in a um, in a matter of a semester basically, um, and that works well. Uh, I'm, it works so well that I think it's getting boring, and I want a uh, a more challenging uh, project. So the I mean SpoofX provides quite a bit of. Uh, 
of things already. So it 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 becomes uh, yeah. easier and easier to define these things. When we when we started looking at static semantics, you still had to define type checkers in Stego, and it was quite challenging. I think now with statics, it when you get the hang of these predicates and name binding is. Uh, it is pretty uh, easy to put something like this together. And so for the, the new course, uh, I want to, well, have a more, uh, a somewhat more ambitious uh, project. But I think as you saw, at, at least for, for syntax, uh, but also for static semantics, sort of, you can do a lot of quick experimentation, right? I mean, I didn't maybe emphasize that, but in the, in the environment, you saw that I'm in Eclipse, uh, I, and defining the language and I'm using it at the same time. So you don't have to sort of compile your language, then start up a new Eclipse in which you, you use it and then go back. It's a pretty smooth um, feedback uh, feedback cycle. And it's, so I think it's very nice for doing uh, language design experiments and for and also for students to, to, uh, to learn these, uh, these kinds of uh, concepts. Thanks. Any other questions, Fabio? Um, I'd be in, I, I'd be more interested in in the incremental stuff. So um, mm -hmm. in the in the example with the structures uh, that you that you had last, um, when you when you have a structural value and press dot, um, right? And and like so, uh, the the impression that I got is that so far the program has to has to be in a relatively good syntactic shape to really be able to do something. Oh, for error recovery, you mean, or hmm? uh, yeah. for error recovery? Yeah. yeah, let's let's have a look at that. Uh, I didn't. I wasn't impressed with the error recovery I was seeing. So let's, uh, uh, at least in the early examples. Um, Um, right, so here I just made a, an error in the, uh, I removed the, the closing paren. Um, if we look at the, uh, at the parse tree of that, uh, I basically get, uh, get all of the parse tree. Um, and, uh, and it, and it still, uh, and it still does the right thing. I can, I can start destroying more. Well, it would probably be useful to look at a closer example or a smaller example. Otherwise, uh, this is a bit hard to to see. Um, uh, right, but so so. So, but your question. Um, so so say you delete like um, the the last line and then uh, a bunch of a bunch of additional characters such that you have an XS there, right? Um, let's let's go to our sandbox. Uh, we're doing what? Oh, wait. Uh, what are we going to do? Right. Uh, so, so basically, the, oh, the last line, and, and yeah, exactly. Got. Okay. So now, if you now if you press dot, yeah. Right. So, so one thing that I would be interested in is is like getting a list of of potential fields. Yes, absolutely. And that was the code completion I was I was talking about. Um, so, the. Um, but that's slightly different, right? The, the the thing you seem to talk about was more about filling filling holes that you already know are are there. Okay. So like bigger syntactic expressions. Right. Okay. Right. So, so let's let me talk about code completion a bit. Then. So the uh, code complete. So here we have an erroneous program, right? That we want to recover from, and then we want to do code completion, right? I mean, we want to fill in something for the. And our uh, idea is that uh, code completion basically is is two parts. It is inferring this kind of syntactic uh, completion. Um, so I could, I could. Uh, complete this thing uh, with an identifier, for example. And the other thing is filling in something for a um, um, for such a placeholder. And that is a that is an operation that is on the that is that works on the tree. Right? I just have a tree and there's a placeholder and now I can do a an operation that says, well, what are valid proposals to fill in for this placeholder? 
And uh, we have separated those, uh, those operations uh, and, and saying, well, code completion really is a matter of filling in these kinds of placeholders. And then there's a second operation that says, well, if we have an in invalid pro, can we do placeholder inference, basically to figure out what kind of, um, um, uh, what kind of placeholders could be, could be, uh, could be there. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Yep. And, um, and actually, so the placeholder inference isn't uh, always doing a, uh, a job that you want, would want it to do. Um, so that can, uh, so there's room for improvement there. Um, yeah, presumably also depends a lot on the language for what's possible to do there. Uh, yeah, so, well, basically the idea of placeholder inference is, is similar to, uh, to the sort of the permissive grammars that I showed before. Right, so you can, um, so basically you could say, um, um, where is my syntax? Um, this is record syntax, I suppose. Right, I, so the syntax for dot is, um, is projection, right? And I could say, um, I could have another production that says exp dot, well, dot, uh, and that is a, a recover production. Um, uh, nee, nog niet. Well, they're wondering whether I'm done. <laughs> uh, so now, um, well, I got an even bigger error. Um, so now, uh, so well, the error I get is semantic, I guess. Well, I get syntax error, right? I mean, because I, I've, I've said that this is a recover production, so that said, well, it's it's a wrong thing. Um, but this kind of thing can be used as a. Um, well, but yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, to, to basically reconstruct a syntactic structure that we can then do a completion on. And there's a, so we have a default mapping from grammars to extend grammars with from permissive productions to make it more, to add these kinds of uh, errors. And um, uh, well, so we can work on the defaults to, to improve the defaults, but we can, you can also make language specific cases for this, for this kinds of recovery to, to improve, uh, improve this kind of recovery. Um, yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry to keep you. Um, from, no, that's uh, fine. I mean, I'm I'm enjoying myself, so uh, I'm happy cool. to. Uh, uh, then, then I guess one more one more question there. Um, I have time, so. Uh, um, so for um, when you when you infer the placeholders, um, do you then kind of implicitly assume that there would be only one kind of placeholder there? Because, uh, um, um, no. uh, for example, no, no. So, okay, so let's. Okay, we want to. Where do I find the permissive grammar, um, Eduardo? Mm. Oh, it's in it's in a term format, right? Um, oh, did he leave? Um, no, no. So, okay. So, so the idea basically is what we do is um, given a, a sort in a production, we define, um, okay, let, let's just look at the, the actual, at the actual syntax here. Um, let's make this smaller. Um, uh, even smaller. Okay. All right, so this is a program that has a uh, expression per placeholder. So basically what we do for every sort, we define uh, x dot uh, x placeholder 
to be a production uh, that has uh, that has this index. And and we do that for every sort. So and and so we, such a placeholder can only occur at the place of a placeholder, right? So if I uh, if I would define a fun of uh, something like this, uh, well, that's a syntax error because at the point of a of an argument, we we expect an uh, an identifier, right? Uh, so you get a syntactically correct tree with uh, with placeholders. Uh, right. So what I meant is, um, say that you have you have a distinct category for field names and method names, and and you have a variation of X dot proj that has X dot um, field name. And say X again. Dot... Uh, sorry, I was I wasn't paying attention. Say yeah. again. So say you have X dot. So you have syntactically different categories of, of field names and method names. Like one is all uppercase and one is all lowercase. Mm -hmm. Um, and then you have a, a production that's like x dot field name, and one that's x dot method name open paren arguments, whatever mm -hmm. close paren, right? So now you've written x dot, and you're trying to infer what kind of placeholder goes there. But now you there, there's like it's not there's, clear. There are multiple possible. Them. Yes. Yeah. But that's the same as as saying uh, I have an expression placeholder, uh, and. There are multiple possible syntactic completions, right? Uh, so that's ambiguous in a sense, if you want. I mean, there's mm -hmm. multiple. There's lots of possible um, things I can I can fill in here. Just I mean, there could be this method name or that, or, or right. So that's that. These are, these are just syntactic variations. So okay, I guess you can just merge them and, and like the, the variations that you get from them. Yes, and so basically what we're doing now with semantic completion is to take these syntactic proposals and filtering them by uh, applying constraints, uh, constraint resolution. And then you say, well, only the things that are, are type correct. And if it's an identifier, if it's something that resolves to, what, what are the things that are in scope? And these things we can now, we, we can now propose. All right. Here's a little extension to the tutorial I gave on uh, on Tuesday. So during the presentation, I uh, got confused a bit by this slide and thought, "Oh, this slide is wrong." And uh, and then uh, I was looking at the code and and the uh, actual policy, the resolution policy I'd implemented didn't work there either. And uh, so that I found it a bit frustrating. And uh, so I've fixed the issue. Well, uh, so first of all, on, on one hand, uh, this slide is not wrong. Uh, uh, on the other hand, it is wrong. So, so what I want to do now is to uh, explore exactly what is going on, uh, both in the slides and in the in the code. So let's go back to uh, look at what the problem here was originally. So to, to do that, I have to go back a couple of slides. Um, so the issue here is we are studying um, resolution in uh, of, of module names of imports. And, and let me actually go back to uh, the original model here. So in modules, uh, what we do is we declare a, uh, a module name in the, in the main scope, in the root scope. And then we add a parent edge from the module scope to the, to the root scope in order to allow lexical bindings, uh, in order to allow uh, bindings in the module to see bindings outside, right? For example, the C here should, be, should resolve to the C in the outer scope. Um, uh, and then if we uh, look at imports, imports are names that are resolved in a scope. For example, the import of B over here, um, is uh, resolved in a scope. It goes through the parent edge and then it finds a declaration in that, uh, in that main scope. And that is fine according to the policy, which we've defined here, which has uh, uh, resolve import names in the mod namespace through zero or more P edges. Um, okay, so this import, so the name of the import resolves to this declaration and the effect then in this uh, in this policy here is to add an edge from the importing scope to the uh, imported scope 
the one that we obtain through the resolution of the import path. Okay, so that leads to uh, adding that uh, import edge and subsequently we can resolve names in um, in a module through that import edge and through the exist the, the P edge we already have. Right, so for example here the C C is resolved through the parent edge to the lexical scope uh, and the lexical parent scope and B is resolved through this import edge to the definition in module B. Okay, so um, another policy here is that uh, now we can get situations like this where we have multiple um, resolutions that are reachable with the same name. Right? For example, here we have the situation that uh, we have a declaration of B in the root scope and we have declaration of B in the imported scope. And so this use of B in module A has two possible resolutions. We can resolve it through the parent edge to the outer scope or through the import edge to the, uh, uh, the B scope. Okay, so now we need to resolve that. Uh, we resolve that by means of a bad specificity order. In this case, we choose to say uh, import uh, resolutions uh, are preferred over parent resolution. So in this case, we would prefer the blue path over the red path. Okay. Um, so now, um, so this works from you, mutual imports, mutually recursive imports, um, and transitive imports, etc. But now let's look at uh, nested modules. Um, so here we have the same resolution policy uh, and modules are declarations. So modules can occur and nested within other modules. Um, and so what we would like to do in, in a module is import the module and then import the modules nested in that module, right? So that's what we're doing here. So the idea here is we want to resolve a uh, little b here to the b in the in module a.b. And in order to do that, we first import a, and then we import b, which becomes reach, reachable because we have imported a. And uh, okay, so how does this work in our uh, policy over here? We um, resolve a, the import name in, uh, in module C. Uh, we can resolve that through the parent edge in the, in the global scope zero uh, to this uh, declaration here. Uh, and that means we add an import edge from uh, the importing scope three to the imported scope one. Uh, and now, now next we want to resolve the import of B uh, we re again, we resolve the name. Uh, when we look at the parent scope, there's no B over there, but there is a B following this, uh, this import edge uh, to this declaration over here. So we reach the module, the, the scope of, uh, so we get the type of B over here and its scope is two. So we construct an import edge from scope three to scope two to represent that import. And subsequently we can resolve uh, the, the variable B in this scope through this import edge over here. All right, everything's fine. Uh, this whole approach works for nested imports. At least that's what it seems. So now uh, let's look at the variation of the scenario. So now I've renamed the nested module to be, uh, to also be named A. And well, that's not a problem in itself, right? I mean, uh, and, uh, but now let's see what happens to resolution. So we resolve A again in the global scope. We end up right through the parent edge. We end up in this declaration. We add an import edge and now we can uh, resolve the second A. Uh, and uh, well, there's two possible ways, right? So we can resolve it through the parent edge or through the import edge. Uh, it is resolvable to, to, this, uh, to this declaration over here. And because we have this disambiguation rule uh, that says that we prefer imports over parents, uh, this A 
resolves to that A, and therefore we add this import edge. However, I mean, there's really not a difference between the two imports over here. I mean, this one was also just an import of, uh, of A. And so actually the, the original resolution to, uh, to the, uh, of, of this A to the outer A uh, is no longer valid, right? If we, uh, if we would re-resolve um, A in, uh, in this new situation, um, well, in the situation where we would have added the, uh, the import edge, then like the resolution of, of this A, this A should also resolve to that A. Um, but the, the, the resolution of the original resolution of A to the outer A caused this import edge. So if we now resolve this A to the inner A, then, well, there's no justification for editing this import edge and therefore we cannot actually resolve A. So this is the, uh, the, the paradox we're in. Um, so in, in statics, the requirement is that resolution answer should be stable. Um, so, uh, so when we do resolutions after we've constructed the whole scope graph, that those answers should be the same as we uh, did them originally. So if we do a query that may result in later changing it is on result, right? So we, here we have a resolution of A uh, that then causes this I edge to be added, which actually causes the resolution of the same, same A to be changed, that is no longer valid. And uh, so uh, statics will get stuck on such, uh, on such queries. Um, we are still looking at a way to, to detect whether specification can, can get stuck. But for now, uh, at least they don't, uh, static specifications are sound, so they never produce scope graphs that are, are inconsistent where, where query results are not stable. And we can actually solve this problem by a better encoding. And the, the better encoding is to say, well, we want really what, what we want to do this properly is to have uh, an ordered, uh, we need to scope imports. Namely, what we want to say is when, when we import a module A, uh, then we want to create a new scope and, and whatever we imported is then available to the rest of the module, but it's not available to itself. So we cannot influence by importing a module, we cannot influence its own resolution. And we achieve that here by uh, introducing, by rather than having modules as a just a bag of declarations, we introduce this notion of uh, uh, declaration groups, um, and, uh, and declaration groups are separated by semicolons, and the, the declarations in one group are visible in, in the next group, uh, but not the other way around. So this import A is not visible in this is not visible in this declaration group. And we model that in this graph uh, as follows, right? So we resolve A in, in the outer scope through the P edge. We add an I edge and, uh, and then we resolve the next group in a new scope. And, uh, and what we do here is we create a parent edge to that scope. And now we resolve A uh, in, this, uh, in this scope. And we, and we can resolve that through the parent edge, through the I edge to this A edge. Well, but now you might say, well, we can still resolve this A import through this import scope or this import edge. And, and so that is still problematic. But what we do here now is we slightly adapt the resolution policies for module names requiring that um, um, import name should be resolved through at least one parent edge. So rather than saying, well, we can resolve through this import edge, we always first have to resolve to a parent edge and then, uh, then we're there. And, and so this works, and this, so this, this slide actually works. This model actually works. We've resolved this edge, this import through this parent edge and this one through this parent edge and then through the import edge to the, uh, to the A scope over here. So I was a bit confused, but the, the, the thing is why this works is that we have changed the resolution policy. Still, uh, this model isn't entirely right. And that's what I realized when I was looking at the code. So now 
let's switch to uh, to Eclipse and look at uh, what this code looks like and, and how that can be fixed. All right, so we're back in uh, in Eclipse, and what we have here is the um, the model I had originally implemented for uh, for members, and the I've slightly changed the specification uh, on uh, as compared to the slides. So um, let's quickly look at the syntax. Um, so what we have here, a module uh, has a bunch of members, and members is either a bunch of declarations, so zero or more declarations, or it is a sequential composition of members. And that's these declaration groups. And, uh, and so here in the spec, we see, well, here we have a, a declaration group and here we have a declaration group that are sequentially composed. Okay, um, so to uh, specify that, what we do, uh, so before in the model, uh, the simple model was just check that all declarations are okay. Now we have a check, a predicate that checks that the members of a module are okay, which uh, is when it's just a group of, of declarations then it's checking that the de declarations are okay. Uh, but if it's such a sequential composition, then we, it's like a, a let like construct. We check that the first group is okay in the, in the scope, uh, in the given scope as one. We create a new scope for the uh, subsequent group. And we check that those members are in that scope. And we do construct this P edge from the, the next group of declarations to the previous group of declarations so that declarations in that previous group are available in the next group, but not the other way around. Okay, so, uh, and, and when I was looking at the implementation during the tutorial, so this, this works fine in the scenario that uh, I showed on the slides, right? So we have a nested module E over here that defines a, an F and, um, and that now correctly resolves. And if I remove the, the declaration group here, so the, the edges are both in the same, uh, the same group, then um, this, uh, this doesn't work anymore. And let me check um, because now the two E declarations both uh, go to the same um, the same module. Okay, so I've so I've the, the resolution policy is slightly different than on the slide. So what I've done here is I've defined a query that says you can resolve a module through zero or more P edges, and then uh, zero or more i edges, right? So to have this policy that you cannot resolve in the parent in the parent lexical parent after you go through an import. Uh, but in the uh, on the slide, I said, well, we need to adapt this policy to first go through a p edge always, uh, and not directly go to a, an i edge. Uh, but I've modeled that here slightly differently by defining a scope of parents uh, predicates that well gives the the parents of the current uh, the current scope, and then when I'm resolving a, uh, a an import, uh, I first take the scope of the current. Uh, <laughs> it should really be called the, the parent of the scope. So the, the parent of the current scope S, and then we start resolving in that uh, in that scope. So that, that gives us the policy that we saw on the on slide. So if we, if I would instead um, uh, resolve directly in a scope, we would get into, into this situation where queries get, uh, get stuck. And, and that leads to uh, a result like, uh, like this. Um, okay, so we do want to resolve in the parent of the current scope. Let me just rename that. Uh, This is silly. Um, oh, that's a scope of parent would work as well. Um, okay, uh, but now you're right. And I, if I uh, if I use this uh, 
uh, declaration group, then I correctly resolve through this parent edge. But now the problem is that if I have a, uh, um, if, right, so if, if I would add a module um, H and I define A in there, and here I would import a uh, module H um, and through a, so let's say through a, well, let, okay, let's first do this and then uh, check that. Uh, then this works fine, right? So we import E and in E we import H. So we can transit, do, we have transitive imports so that works fine. But if I would use a, uh, a separate declaration group for, uh, for H, then in order to resolve A, I go through this, the import H from, from G to E uh, but actually, I would end up in the in the bottom scope here, and now there's a parent edge going through module H. Uh, well, there's a parent edge going to the import scope, uh, in, to the scope in which this import is is uh, imported. This H module is imported, and and then I have an I edge, and that doesn't quite work with the uh, resolution policy for variables, right? Because I said, well, we shouldn't. We shouldn't uh, uh, resolve uh, after we do an import. We don't want to expose the lexical environment of that module uh, to to um, importing modules. So therefore, we have this policy that we first resolve through a bunch of parent edges and then through a bunch of I edges. And the uh, the scope graph I've, I've just created here is uh, I edge, parent edge, I edge. So that doesn't quite work. And, and that's what I saw during the tutorial. Then I said, okay, so we need we, we need something else for the for the inner parents of a of a module. And so the uh, idea I came up with is to introduce a to label these uh, edges differently uh, using the M label. Uh, and then things should be fine. And so what I said here is, uh, well, I have. I can still do some M edges. Uh, and that was a bit uh, too simplistic. Uh, so, so really what we want to do is we want to resolve. Uh, so now we get a chain of, uh, of M edges. Um, And uh, so you want to resolve through a bunch of M edges and then you can do more imports. So really we want to be able to, to alternate uh, M edges and, uh, and I edges. Um, and uh, furthermore, so that's for variables. Furthermore, for modules, we also want to resolve the imports through those M edges as well, right? Before I said, well, you can, you should at least go to one parent edge, but there might be a whole bunch of those and, and those should be, uh, uh, should those become possibly M edges as well. So also for modules, we, uh, wait, we want to be able to, um, let's see, go through uh, M edges, um through M edges here as well. And then if we look at parents at, at parent of scope, then the parent may also be an M edge. Um, so now if we uh, so now everything works fine, uh, right? So, the uh, A uh, variable here is resolved through the import that ends up in the uh, in this scope. Uh, there's an M edge to this scope, and then there's an I edge to uh, to to this scope, and and then we're then we're there. And even if we add more, uh, 
and this should work out fine. And we also get, get shadowing. Well, let's test that. So if we would make this a Boolean, right? If this is, uh, if we make this a Boolean, in this case, we get a duplicate definition. Um, and, uh, but if we make this a declaration group, then uh, uh, this A, I mean, this A shadows that A and we get the right behavior, right? And if we swap those, we see that uh, we get an error here because now it thinks that uh, this thing, well, it, it sees that this thing is a Boolean. Okay, uh, so that's it. Let me go to, uh, to the, back to the slides. Um, uh, where is it? So here we are. So this slide indeed was wrong, but for the, for another reason than, than I, I thought. And, and really what it should be is, uh, it should be something like this. So we use a different edge for these uh, internal module edges, uh, and we need to adapt the, the resolution policy for modules and also for variables as we saw in order to be able to, uh, to resolve through those, uh, through those images. And then we get a nice uh, resolution policy to, uh, to resolve these, uh, these modules. All right, that was it. Um, I hope you enjoyed the, uh, the tutorial. And uh, if you have any questions, then uh, try out SpoofX. Let us know. Uh, join us on the SpoofX users channel on our Slack organization. And uh, send me an email if you want to get invited on that.